Back in 2010, I wrote an article for my blog entitled, What I Don't Want for 2010. And then recently, I updated it to What I Don't Want for 2013. But the more I think about it, the things I listed in the article are really things that I'll probably spend the rest of my life trying to extricate from myself. Well, anyway, we have a lot of new subscribers here on our YouTube channel, and I assume that not all of our YouTube subscribers necessarily read on the blog. And if you don't, why not? The blog is accessible at the address above my head, and you're welcome to come by and read, but I thought that that particular article might make a good YouTube video, so I'm going to read that article to you here. I printed it out, and uh, I operate on the assumption that there's really nothing more fun than listening to Jim Reed. In any case, this is entitled, Now, What I No Longer Want, and it starts with this. I've spent a great deal of my life pursuing and pretty effectively attaining my wants and my desires. Unfortunately, because I am a depraved person, a fact that I can prove with ample evidence, my wants and desires were equally depraved. And eventually, the constant diet of fulfilled sinful desire became wearying and soul-stultifying. As I look back, I've learned two important lessons. One, every bad, painful, horrid thing that ever happened to me, I didn't see coming. And two, every truly good thing that has occurred in my life happened despite me. So what is instantly clear is that I am not in control. And on those occasions where it appeared that I had some influence over the outcome of things, I always mess them up. So, why would I want control? Why would I want things to work my way? Early on in my Christian conversion, I was taught a wonderful guiding principle. It's this. God is too holy not to do that which brings him the greatest glory. And he loves us too much not to do that which is for our greatest good. In other words, he's going to do things his way, whether we like it or not. Now, that's what sovereign providence is all about. So, from this point onward, I no longer want my way. In my early 20s, I decided to move to Los Angeles. That decision was driven by the need to be famous. It was no longer sufficient to have people in the Detroit area know me. I wanted a national stage. And rock music was the vehicle that would take me there. I had performed for two seasons and toured Great Britain with the Houston All-City Symphony. I had played intimate jazz and big band swing. I had played in garage bands, club bands, marching bands, pit bands, and show bands. But rock and roll was like the express elevator to worldwide recognition. It was hard work, it was emotionally draining, but it paid big dividends, and that was just fine with me. But as Christianity took hold in my heart and my mind, thoughts of my own personal advancement and fame became increasingly upsetting and revolting. How, I began to wonder, can Christ truly be all and in all if I'm constantly making sure that there's adequate room for me? I can't save anyone. My death will not result in anyone else's redemption. I am quite utterly imperfect. I cannot heal sickness, solve crises, prevent catastrophes, or bring the dead to life. All in all, I'm hardly a person to be admired or imitated, because when it comes down to really important matters, I can only point to the one who actually matters. So, why should I be famous? He should have all the fame, because he 
has all the power, and I need him far more than he needs me. So, I no longer want my fame. At one point in my life, I reveled in the notion that I was the quintessential tortured artist. My thoughts, emotions, and feelings were significant enough that they needed to be shared with the whole world. I wrote songs, I wrote poems, I wrote stories, I wrote, well, I wrote about me. I basked in my unmitigated emotional depth and my imaginary courage. As I was wont to say, hurt me, I'll make it art. If hubris had a cousin, I was it. I have several folders and notebooks full of poems and scribblings. I took them out the other night, and I realized that it has been years since I've written anything poetic. Now, self-expression seems vain in every meaning of that word. Now, whatever gifts God may have given me with which to communicate thoughts and ideas, I prefer to convey those thoughts and ideas that exalt Him for his great kindness to me, and those which, according to Ephesians 4.29, minister grace to the hearer. So, from now on, I no longer want my own art. Sometimes cleverness is its own reward. People gravitate to clever people who can devise inventions, turn a pithy phrase, or appear to be a few steps ahead of the matting crowd. Cleverness is also akin to sarcasm, the ability to slice and dice others with a bit of witty repartee. And for many years, my sharp tongue was the chief weapon in my arsenal of tools used to keep everyone at arm's distance. As I've aged, I have been cursed with the ability to remember all of the verbally bloodied victims I've left in my wake. And, successful in my attempt to keep everyone at a safe distance, I found myself alone. Cleverness is also its own worst enemy. Christianity, by contrast, insists on putting the well-being of others ahead of our own. Christianity instructs us to keep a civil tongue and to use kind words. Christianity is not about being clever. It's about being a servant, about giving yourself away and investing in the fruitful outcome of others. And that's not done by wit. That's done by humility. And no matter how clever I think my thoughts or my words are, they are of absolutely no significance if they do not aid the Christian progress of the person who hears them. So, I no longer want my own cleverness. As a human, I crave. I have deep, entrenched desires. There was a time when I thought that my passion for the things of this world was noble. I was never more alive than when I was lunging headlong into my latest craving. I was deep, after all. I felt things more vividly and violently than most folk, or at least that's how I saw myself. It made me unique and worth all of the attention I was getting. Consider Psalm 37.4 for a moment. It says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, that's a dangerous statement, unless the Lord changes the desires of your heart. And that's what happened to me. The more I have learned to delight myself in the Lord, the more he has become my primary desire. And sure enough, the more he reveals himself to me, the more I am delighted. Now, my passion is for him, his glory, his word, his worship, and his people. One of the most amazing things about genuine Christian conversion is that God does not suppress our emotions. He redirects them. 
What was once self-love becomes brotherly love. What was once fleshly desire becomes heavenly desire. What was once selfish passion becomes the desire to spread his word, to call sinners to repentance, and to help them to see the one who is gracious, kind, patient, and altogether lovely. So, I no longer want my own sinful passions. Through an act of amazing charity, I was recently given a set of drums. There was a time when I was defined by my ability to play drums, and if I didn't practice for at least three hours a day, I wasn't alive. Playing drums was as natural as breathing. Although I used to own several drum kits, I haven't owned any drums for 15 years or more. When the kids were young, I was struggling financially and I had fallen behind on the house payments. So I sold my last pearl kit for exactly the amount that it took to keep us in our house, and since then I had been drumless. I told you that story to tell you this one. After I was given a beautiful set of pearl drums, my favorite drums, by the way, I told a musician friend of mine about the remarkable circumstances that led to the gift, and he said, that's great, Jim, you deserve them. And those words hung in the air for a moment. And then I replied, no, I don't deserve them, and the last thing I want is what I deserve. You see, one essential element of a really advanced ego, and trust me on this one, I'm an expert in this area, is the assumption that you deserve all of the good things that come your way. And if something really bad happens, well, that's an aberration. That's sort of like the thinking that leads to questions like, why do bad things happen to good people? The Bible declares that there are no good people. There are only sinners, enemies of God, haters of everything that is holy. There are wicked, depraved people. So the proper question is, why do good things happen to bad people? And that's the essence of grace. What I deserve, as it turns out, is hell forever. What I deserve is God's eternal wrath. What I deserve is to be separated from him permanently and perpetually. Fire, brimstone, torment, that's what I deserve. But what I'm promised is heaven. Through no goodness on my part, as a result of no good works that I have performed, but merely as a matter of God's mercy, I will not receive what I deserve. I have received grace. I am receiving grace, and I will receive grace. So, from this point forward, I do not want what I deserve. Now, here's the great irony of God's genius. As much as I do not want my own way, my way is inexorably becoming conformed to his way. In other words, I do not feel in any way cheated or shortchanged. I am fulfilled and happy. Just as I grew tired of my way, he changed my way to suit his way, and I most joyfully now pursue the way that I find most pleasing, which is his way. As much as I am no longer interested in my own fame, I get great joy from seeing him exalted. And though I could never have predicted it, GCA and Salvation by Grace have become widely known on the internet. I receive wonderful letters and email from people who share their lives and their testimonies with us. We hear from all corners of the globe and people tell us how their lives and their faith have been enriched by listening and reading at our website. And honestly, it's overwhelming and deeply gratifying. But this newfound recognition is not fame. 
It's not a matter of ego. It's God's providential wisdom at work. He allowed me to bask in my own aggrandizement until I could smell ego a mile away. And once that smell was repugnant, he put me into his service. Then he let people know who we were and what we were about. His ways are wonderful. As much as I do not want my own art, God does not destroy the individuality of his people. He gifts his own with the abilities that are best suited to their place in his kingdom. I was given the gift to communicate. Being Irish, I have always had the gift of gab. And when folk tell me that the Bible finally makes sense to them, or that I have helped them to understand complex biblical concepts in a way that makes it simple and approachable, that's just God turning my art to his glory. It's no longer about self-expression. It's about heavenly expression. Same ability, new purpose. Cleverness, I suppose, falls into that same rubric, But where I used to show off my own verbal and intellectual dexterity, my concern now is to show off God's astounding wisdom and the limitless value of his word. It's not about being clever. It's about being clear, being precise, being a tool in the hand of the master craftsman. As much as I do not want my own sinful passions, God has redirected my passion. He hasn't squelched it. Much as he used the temperament of Moses or the boldness of Peter, God has taken what was once debauched and turned it toward his own holy purposes. Christianity has enlivened and enriched my passion, giving it a righteous purpose and restraining it from its unseemly past. His grace is beyond comprehension. And as much as I do not want what I deserve, as Christ has been formed in my heart, I want him to receive everything that he deserves. He deserves a church that will recognize their status as his elect and beloved bride and act like it. He deserves to have his word revered, respected, and rightly handled. He deserves to be glorified through the eternal ages because of his finished, complete, fully effective, atoning work and the full salvation of his chosen people. He deserves to sit at the Father's right hand and be lifted above all names and all creation. He deserves to be worshipped and adored. He deserves the very best that his Father can prepare and give him. And I want him to have all of that. Now, let me close this bit of New Year's observation by driving home one really vital point. This is nothing like me. Left to myself, I would always want my way and my fame and my art and my cleverness and every sinful passion that my evil heart could inspire. And I would be fully convinced that I deserved every moment of pleasure and every egocentric gratification because that's exactly what I'm like. Well, this short treatise is evidence of how effectively and how sovereignly God has overcome and overwhelmed a wretch like me. I get no glory from it, nor have I earned any. He gets all the glory because He's done all the work. He invested all the effort, and he is fully responsible for any and all good results. I am astounded at his grace. I am secured by his mercy. I am reassured by his love. I am thankful. I am humbled. And I want him more than I want myself. I have to admit that since originally writing this article back in 2010, 
Not only have I witnessed God's kindness in many, many facets of life, but I have quite nearly reached the most elusive of all human goals, contentment. The Apostle Paul wrote this, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now, at last, you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. That's Philippians 4, 10 to 13. Now, I knew this attitude doctrinally, but now I'm learning it experientially. And I got to tell you, it's great. The more I lean on God's sovereign providence and admit repeatedly that whatever he does is good, the more content I have become with every decision that he has made regarding my life and ministry. It's not about wealth or poverty, full or hungry, abundance or neediness. It's about knowing who we are in Christ, our heavenly destiny, and his faithfulness to his people in all circumstances. After beatings, stonings, shipwreck, imprisonment, and being abandoned by, quote, everyone in Asia, Paul wrote that he was content. After receiving a gift while under house arrest, he wrote that he had no wants. And I find that astounding, because I live in air conditioning and carpeting and plentiful food and a variety of entertainments, and an army of friends and supporters. My needs are more than supplied. I have abundance, and yet I still have wants. And I still struggle to be content, but I'm getting there. I'm closer than I was three years ago. To be content in this life is the goal. And by his grace, by his providence, despite the ups and downs of life, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So, here's what I do want. I want to be conformed to his will and to learn to be truly content. And that would make this a mighty fine year. Thanks for listening. I hope it was helpful.